works for me. All right, so we are recording. We are live on Facebook, and okay. we will, let me see, go to Facebook. You don't um, have your uh, earphone things on, your headset. No, I don't have to. This system I have, well, hopefully there's no echo. But, no, um, sounds great. Yeah, it. I'm pretty sure it does all that stuff. So, well, I'm not that cool. I have my, my I bought this a while ago when I was <laughs> a lot just messing around with a buddy doing uh, audio. He was uh, recording and had friends that came by after we went to the clubs and they were doing all sorts of stupid stuff. Oh, cool. Yeah, it got fun. So we have yeah. a little studio set up, which helps. Um, I hate here wearing the headphones for like an hour. Or I hour. know, I know. I, I have my, I haven't found a headset yet, but I, I just have my earbuds in. So I have these cool little white lines all across me, but that's okay. <laughs> all right, let's see. Close down my chats. Go to the group. We are live. We got four people on there. All right, so we will start. Welcome back, everybody. This is episode four of Anissa and Whitney. Uh, we are discussing tonight... We love containments, the importance of containments. We're not going to get into everything as if it was a class. This is definitely not a class. Mm -hmm. uh, this is just our viewpoint on what we think the importance of and how important we think containments are within our industry and our day-to-day -day world, whether it be construction, remediation, drying, so on and so forth. There's needs for it on all levels. We were just talking about how even with contents, there is a necessity for bringing in a proper containment. So, as we are going here, guys, we got three or four people on. Please uh, post your questions and comments in here, mm -hmm. and I will make sure to keep an eye on them, and we'll answer as many questions as we have as we can. Uh, mm -hmm. But I want to go into it. So uh, welcome back. This is our fourth episode. We're on a roll. We haven't missed any. So I'm glad that I have somebody to do this with that actually shows up on time every time besides my technical difficulties, which I think are just becoming a norm. Uh, with this type of situation, but I uh, appreciate this. This is good. Uh, we're, mm -hmm. We've we've seemed to get some good videos and some good content, so I appreciate you joining me again. So let's discuss the purpose of containment. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I think everybody that uses containments for the most part, I would say, is for either asbestos or for mold remediation. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, lead abatement is another uh, big untalked about sector of what we do with uh, containments uh, and there's also a lot of other reasons why people would use containments which we'll get into as far as drywall work with the new silica laws that are going into place uh, as well as just painting fumes dust uh, odors that you're going to be dealing with so mm -hmm. we'll talk about a lot of those different things uh, and the reasons behind it obviously the functionality being odor noise visual you know, your customers just don't want their mm -hmm. customers seeing uh, what's going on on the project or uh, contaminants, which we don't want to cross contaminate the environment, which is absolutely huge. Uh, that's the main reason that we set up containment is cross contamination, whether it be cross contamination of noise, cross contamination of odors, cross contamination of whatever it may be, eyesores, <laughs> you name it. Uh, but what it is that we're talking about tonight is containments. And the fact is that I personally love containments. If you've seen a lot of my posts and a lot of my pictures from the past, I have built some pretty cool containments. I love building containments. It's like, I guess as uh, Bradley Green and a couple of the other guys will say, it's like building a fort. <laughs> so, you get to be a kid again and build a fort out of materials that somebody else is willing to pay for in order for you to achieve an actual goal other than just crawling through and <laughs> like so um, tonight, uh, we'll get into, let's start talking about the different sizes of containments. Um, through these different conversations, we're going to talk about the different functions and the different purposes as we go along the way. Um, I think the main purpose, like we said, is for a lot, <clears throat> for mostly for reduction of cross-contamination, uh, usually through uh, abatement purposes, through asbestos, lead, or mold, uh, hazardous contaminants. As we are entering a new day and new age with OSHA, uh, we're getting into silica. So as I just mentioned a little bit ago, you have to make sure that we're dealing with silica here. Um, not only do I put up, personally, I put up containments on a lot of my job sites just to reduce dust because it reduces secondary cleaning of content. Um, it is also very important for me to make sure that my customers' contents, their house, their living environment is affected in the least minimal way, in the least, What's the best way to put that? 
I want to make sure that they're not affected. Yeah. That their lifestyle is not hindered by the work that we are doing on a, our daily basis. So, so, so that we have um, minimal that, impact, right? Exactly. Minimal impact on their normal yeah. lifestyle that they're living while we are completing the work that we are doing. So um, how often have you heard about customers complaining about noise of your equipment? Oh, like equipment. Yeah, all the time. All the time. I mean, it's, yeah, and yeah. It, I mean, how many times have you walked into a job and they shut off all the equipment because they're like, well, it's just so loud. I couldn't, I, we couldn't even hear ourselves think when we're eating dinner, you know? Exactly. So let's get into the, that breaks us, basically brings us into our first portion of what we're doing. I mean, let's put it up a containment just basically to either reduce noise or reduce access to your customers in order to gain access to the area in which you're working uh, so that your equipment does not get touched. This improves your ability to ensure that you're doing what you're trying to do there without it being messed with. Make sure that your customers are more comfortable in their environment. Make sure that you're also your environment is more efficient because if you're setting this up, most likely you are containing your drying, the energy from your drying equipment into a smaller area. By doing this, you are increasing the efficiency of your drying process. So, um, which leads us into another one with drying chambers. Uh, some people will do different drying chambers and build a lot of different drying chambers, whether it be over wood floors, whether it be uh, around countertops and cabinets, whether it be exterior walls that have to be dried in a certain way. Uh, people are building containments of all sorts of forms of fashion these day and ages. And I've heard a lot of people get kickback. A big discussion has been getting kickback for some of the things that restoration contractors doing to be more creative to essentially in their process of trying to be a better restorer, they're getting kicked back from the adjusters saying, this is just way too much. And this is why would we pay for this? Why would we pay for this big tent in the room? Why would we pay for the structure that you built around this? Why would we do this? Um, I don't think it really matters what their opinion is on why, as long as the reason you're doing it is, is not just to make money. Um, whether it be reduction of noise, whether it be you know, reduction of cross contaminants, no matter what it is, the containment is so important in so many different facets that it doesn't matter whether you're doing a drying job, whether you're doing a mold remediation mm -hmm. job, whether you're doing a contents job, which we'll get into here in a minute. Um, right. Containments are extremely important in your ability as a contractor to control the environment um, and not only control the environment in one section of a property, but control the environment in multiple areas of a property without them being connected and set up on the same HVAC system. So um, containments allow us to do so much as restoration contractors. Mm -hmm. They allow us to limit our liability. They allow us to create a more efficient job. They allow us to truly, truly be better restorers. Um, it's been awesome to see everybody over the last, I guess, six to eight months uh, since the group has really, really taken off, mm -hmm. post the pictures of their containments. Cause I can yeah. tell you that everybody's containment consistently gotten better gradually over time um and this consistent improvement that so many people have made just through going online and interacting with their peers is amazing to me and these are the things why these type discussions are so important um you know and you know Whitney I want to say I think when you talked about pushback I think this is a really great opportunity and I've actually done a couple of videos about you know us versus them and arguing with the adjuster, this sort of thing. And I think this is a really great opportunity for us as restorers to um, use it as an ability to educate an adjuster. Um, you, and you should know and be able to very much articulate why are you doing this containment? You should be able to articulate the value that this containment is giving, not only to, let's say, as you said, speeding up the drying process, but containing mess, um, making your homeowners more comfortable, less stress on them, and educating, and depending on why you're doing it, you know, mold, a silica, whatever it is, maybe there's safety things involved. So it, I think that when you, get a, when you get a pushback like that from an adjuster, don't take it as, er, they're just trying not to pay me for what I need to do. Like, just take my word for it, Mr. Adjuster or Mrs. Adjuster. I, like, I just need to do this. Educate them. Use it as an opportunity to display 
as we talked about, I think it was on the last uh, conversation that we had, your expertise in exactly. your field, right? Like don't take it personally like they just don't want to pay you. See it as an opportunity to be able to um, show your expertise and educate the adjuster. And who knows? Not only may you work with this adjuster again, so your life might be easier next time, but maybe the next restoration contractor that has to deal with the this adjuster is going to have it easier. No, 100%. I mean, <clears throat> every job that I've ever built a really quality containment on, I have not gotten kickback from the adjuster simply because of the fact that they're looking at my job is okay, well, it's obviously isn't the first time he's built a containment because right. I've never seen one like this. He's either new to the job or nobody else in my area is doing containments the same way that I do containments, which mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with that. Um, we'll get into the materials that you can use and how many different material types there are. When I went to class, I took Peter Sirk's, I don't know if I'm saying that properly, um, with the IICRC, probably, it was the first certification that I took with the IICRC. Hmm. Um, and I think, I'm not sure, I haven't talked to him in a couple of years, but I'm pretty sure that he still hasn't registered and we still haven't gotten to break the PVC containments that he builds the same way we did in that class um it's about sealing something and going through all these different classes and learning from different people on their strategies if you will of achieving a containment whether it be do we duck the uh, air scrubber out the window do we duct it back into the clean space in the house do right. we keep it ducted inside the house there's how many different terms have you heard for an air scrubber? Oh, a lot. Negative air machine. Mm -hmm. Air scrubber. HEPA, HEPA filter. filter. Yeah. You know, it, it goes on and on and there's all sorts of acronyms, but there's a few of them that are very important. Air scrubber, negative air machine, and a air, AFD, air filtration device, in my opinion, are the three most important ones to understand. And AFD is essentially the general term for both of the process, for the unit itself, air filtration device, is what it's doing. A NAM, a negative air machine, is a machine that is used specifically to create negative air. Mm -hmm. An air scrubber is when you're using a air filtration device in an effect in order to gain air, you know, air filtration. And so Whitney, for, just for the sake of everybody on, because not everybody may be real familiar with containments, right? Why don't you explain, because I'll bet you can do this really well, what is, what is negative air and what is positive? Explain, explain the difference and what, what each of those are. The simplest way to put it is essentially a negative pressurized capsule is one that is less pressure obviously we know high pressure goes to low pressure so it's always going to go from this side to this side high pressure high always goes to low positive always goes to a negative we know that through our drying process and a lot of the other things that we do and it applies in a lot of the other sciences through what we do so when you're dealing with negative pressure and cross contamination if you consider the fact that i'm building a containment we want to use negative air most people understand negative air for the fact that we want to make sure air is flowing through the door you know in Right. There's a measurement that you have to use, Pascal's, or whether you're using a water column, um, to measure your what it is. And every company, I think, has to determine what set, what level they want their containments to be in order for their systems and their process to work best. Mm -hmm. I personally use a much stronger containment than most people would ever recommend. The reason I do so is because I wanted to pull from other areas and I wanted to create a differential within the property itself so that if there are any other spores hidden within any other substrates, we can bring them out, test for them, find them, figure out where they are, and actually remediate that area. Mm -hmm. it's not first time, pass, fail. Um, in that area, yes, and with what the work you're doing, obviously. Um, but <clears throat> a lot of times down here in Florida, we find a lot of other mold within people's houses. So there's the main area, there's secondary issues. Mm -hmm. there's, there's even triciary issues and things like that. And it goes on and on and on. Um, the main reason for, and the main difference between negative and positive pressure is basically in versus out airs coming in versus airs going out. Um, when you're doing, and this is what we were just talking about a minute ago, when you're doing a 
application job, you want to make sure that the dirty air is not going out into a clean environment. When you're doing a, uh, say, a painting job even, you want to make sure that the VOCs and the odors that are in this area don't escape this uh, your containment and escape into the area that's being lived in so you don't affect the, uh, the occupants within the structure. Right. That's another reason, negative pressure. But say you're doing contents. Uh, right. Say you're doing a, uh, an odor removal process. Uh, mm -hmm. Last thing you want to do is pump you know, air out. So that's a controlled positive pressure system. Uh, contents is a positive, positive pressurized system all the time mm -hmm. based off the fact that you want to make sure that everything that goes on to the area and the materials that you are cleaning are controlled. Every amount of air, nothing's entering the door. It's the same idea when you walk into some of those restaurants. Well, it's not positive pressure, but it's the same concept. The, mm -hmm. air, the, air, the air doors, you know, when you walk into a restaurant down south or something where there's a lot of bugs, they have the air doors to keep bugs out. Mm -hmm. That's not negative pressure, but the same idea is trying to keep the outside stuff from getting inside. So, right. you know, that's an overcomplicated definition of, you know, probably comp I probably confused more people than I did help people on that no, one. No, I think that was really um, good, Whitney. And it, okay. it, it's important that they understand that, right? Because if you're going to be, again, get a pushback from an adjuster, you need to be able to explain why you're doing positive or negative uh, containment. You need to be able to explain that. You know, if you have contents in there in a house like I do on site, so I don't want potentially, I'm doing content, so I've got structure that has issues and odor that I'm not dealing with at the moment. So I want to create a room inside the house where I have positive pressure so I don't have any of that other odor and contaminants coming in there. And, and maybe that's where I'm, I actually set, will set up a deodorizing chamber in the house that way or a drying chamber in the house that way. So you have to be able to articulate that. I think you said that really well, Whitney. You did a good job on that. Yeah, and it's, you know, I use it a lot of times because we'll put, I'll have, say on one job site, we'll have three different negative air chambers in one positive air chamber. Mm -hmm. We're doing our contents cleaning in our positive chamber, but we're doing our remediation in the negative chambers where we're doing a sanitization protocol throughout the areas that are basically not within the containments at all. So we're able to do three different, series of things on a job site all at the same time without having to work from one to the next to the next mm -hmm. doing remediation then doing contents then doing this it's right it's a circus but at the same time it's juggling and as long as you make sure that the right ball goes to the right hand at the right time then the balls don't hit the floor um okay. it's taken a while to figure out how to keep the balls off the floor <laughs> got a pretty good system in place and the reason why i'm so big on containments is the fact that I've seen so many issues come from not spending the time and building a quality containment the first time. Um, I will honestly, every job we put a containment on, I will say at least two guys, if not more, depending on the size of the job, will spend an entire day building a containment on every job, unless it's a tiny job and it's like a doorway or something like that. We'll spend an entire day doing a containment, whether it be floor protection on the, throughout the house and mm -hmm. uh, making sure we put preservation tape and they use levels. I am not going to recommend everybody to use levels. I'm extremely OCD and my guys get yelled at if my preservation tape's not level across the wall and the duct tape's not level across that and I'm just a little bit weird. You know, I did it for so long my way. I want my guys to see my clones. So I expect so much out of them. Poor guys. Well, that's funny because when I do labels on boxes, for contents, they, they have, like, I like them to like, sometimes we have multiple stickers and labels on a box and I, they have an order and they go on a certain side of the box and they have to be level with each other. And there's an order of how they go. <laughs> so I can relate, but you know what, that goes a long, long way for both an adjuster as well as the homeowner, because just look at the professionalism and the care, Whitney, that your client and adjuster are seeing and that speaks a whole lot to your professionalism and there's that word again, your expertise. Uh, you know, it, it, it says a lot in, in that I firmly believe that helps a lot when you're dealing with that whole pushback issue, I think. Yeah, um, it does. It truly does. If you just go throw a containment up, now there's nothing wrong with using zip poles and some, I mean, even using painters plastic, not for mold. There's nothing yeah, where paint yeah. applies to mold other than a dust barrier on some furniture goes into place. Uh, 
but if say you're setting up real quick to do a small little drywall patch, you're going to be in and out in two hours, but you want to make sure that you set up a quality negative air. I've done it before where I take my shop vac, put my shop vac hose in the middle of the room, and I basically turn that thing on with the machine outside, and I'm in a little four by four little cavity. Mm-hmm. My shop vac with a HEPA filter in a bag is good enough. Right. I'm doing drywall, keep in mind. Right. Whereas I can go do the sanding, do this, and it keeps that little area under negative air, and mm-hmm. it keeps the dust under control. So. I can be in and out, do a patch, put some 20 minute mud on or even some five minute mud on something and do a little finished patch. Customer calls you and says, you got to go touch something up. I don't want to spend three hours doing touch up work or doing warranty work, if you will, because the lights all got installed and they installed some new LEDs and now they have a new, you know, a new, a new beam of light that's going across a wall that didn't have any lighting on it before. And they see a little bit of inconsistencies and whether it be a, a brush stroke in the paintbrush or whether it be a little glob of mud that got left behind that someone missed, you know, God knows. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's what we're here for. You know, we stand behind our work and we make sure that we go back and fix those things. And the last thing I want to do is spend four hours doing a drywall repair mm-hmm. when I can be in and out in 15 or 20 minutes. So I use containments. And since I started using containments, I've used them on pretty much everything I do whether it be painting a room, whether it be doing demo, whether it be doing controlled demolition on concrete, concrete cutting uh, mm-hmm. in areas, you know, to whereas I don't want the dust to go on the windows of the storage fronts next door to where we're doing concrete cutting. Those are things that I have to clean. That's money out of my pocket, things that I don't normally budget for. You don't normally sit there and think, okay, we're going to make a complete mess. My guys are going to be completely unprofessional and the wind's going to be blowing from the Southeast and it's going to mm-hmm. rain. So all this dust is going to blow here. It's just the perfect storm. You don't plan that into your bidding. And if you did, you probably wouldn't get the job because you're going to overbid it. So is what it is. Um, and that kind of brings us back to the sizes of the containments. You Mm -hmm. know, are you doing a mold job? Are you doing a drying job? Are you painting? Are you putting up a barrier, a wall way at the end of a job site, just to make sure that your customers don't see, or your customers, customers don't see what you're doing. I've worked in hotels before where we, not necessarily negative air containments, but this is a containment of sorts. We have built temporary walls and finished them the same way the hallway was. So when you walk down the hallway, you just thought it was the end of the hallway. And Mm -hmm. that was that, you know, wallpaper trim, the whole nine. You couldn't tell that it was an end of a hallway. So, you know, guests would go to their rooms in the hotel and it was a motor remediation project that was going on throughout Mm -hmm. the, you know, seven rooms on the floor. So normal here no one had a clue what was going on and then in the back of the shop there was you know all hell breaking loose it was like the butcher shop so (laughs) some people don't want to see you know where the meat comes from right so is what it is so that's a huge containment um and there's a big i just want to say there's a really big part where containment plays into factor there with contents i've done containment where i just sectioned off areas of the house that were very, very bad. Maybe there was a demo going on and I'm in doing contents or I'm packing out and it didn't really help my job any necessarily, but it sure helped the homeowner a lot and it helped them not to have to see, you know, all of, as you said, the busher shop stuff that was going on and it gave them some separation um, and kind of minimize their stress that way. So I think the best way to tell how good of a containment you did too is how much dust escaped, whether it be taking a bag out of your decon chamber and walking it to the door, whether it be a guy took his suit off with the door being open and it went in, dust happened. I mean, you cannot really avoid dust to a point that it will never occur on a job site. You can get it down to a point where it's, barely there and you know mm-hmm. you did a great job and you're super happy you just do a right. little slip for dust at the end of the job you know right. clean. Um, right. oh. but i really think that everybody should judge themselves based off of the secondary effects of their jobs mm-hmm. do a drying job set up a containment in an area that's affected from unaffected mm-hmm. see how much faster your job dries right on your next remediation job set up a, a actual containment that's functioning with a negative air machine and an air scrubber 
working in a fashion to make sure that there's an actual cross flow of air and then there's no dead areas of air because one of the biggest arguments that somebody will have within our industry is mm -hmm. negative errors and scrubbers don't work because there's dead air space and it'll only collect from X amount of distance from the scrubber. Well, if you set up a scenario to whereas that's how you want it to be, yes, you can achieve those results. Mm -hmm. But if you control the environment to a point to whereas you are controlling the airflow both from the return air from your negative air machine, as well as the discharge or exhaust from your air scrubber that's within the unit, you can completely control and make sure that no materials settle and that you're constantly turning the air. And by doing it on a negative air level, as well as an air scrubber, you're not only cleaning the air within the unit itself, as well as doing air changes on the containment. So by doing this, you're ensuring that you can actually get an effective remediation project done without having to use clean room standards or these other things that are being brought to light. I think that there's a balance between what's currently being done and clean room standards that are being discussed that I think need validity. Um, do we need to go this far? Possibly not. Most likely not. Do we need to make sure that we get a little bit farther away from where we are now? Yes, 100%, because I do think the majority of contractors that are setting up containments could definitely use a hands-on class, and there are some good hands-on classes available. Um, you know, you do a lot of the containment classes with hands-on stuff. Mm -hmm. I, a lot of the classes that I teach are kind of, this is the stuff that we teach to whereas we do a lot of hands-on containment classes, teaching people how to fasten different ways to fasten the doorways, different ways to use, whether you're using pressure fitting or whether you're using staples, when is the appropriate time to use staples versus not staples? When's the appropriate time to use pressure fit versus not pressure fit? When's the appropriate time to use wood studs, metal studs, PVC, zip poles do you use six mil do you use black six mil do you use 10 mil do you use clear do you wow. use fire rated fire rated most people don't know that there's a fire rated six mil it's important it would be interesting whitney are you i don't know if anybody's uh anyone listening it'd be really interesting to hear what your guys's thoughts are like are you are do you do a lot of containments right now are you yeah. like Hey guys, this is great information, but I really don't feel like I need a lot of containments. Um, are you having pushbacks, that. right? Like, so, and if you're not, if you're not using a lot of containments, why, I mean, do you feel that they're not important and are you getting pushback? And if you are, what kind of pushback are you getting? Are you getting adjusters saying, I don't want to pay for that. Are you getting them saying, Hey, that's not necessary. Or are they just asking you, why are you doing this? Like, I'm, I'm just curious if anybody's on that would share that with us, that'd be great. Yeah. Uh, Parker mentioned a couple of minutes ago that he brought up the fact that silica dust, which we were talking about. And, you know, that's extremely important that everybody understands. I mean, I've seen a lot of videos even now, anybody who's doing concrete cutting now, I mean, every video I've seen concrete cutting that's new has dust extraction systems and this and that. And containments are going to be huge when it comes to silica work, even demo, uh, demolishing, just doing demo on drywall for any reason. Uh, containments right. is essential. Um, uh, Parker also just mentioned that he does, uh, he uses black, uh, he uses only, he only uses black on trauma jobs. Um, I would agree with that. It's probably important to use it on a trauma job. I use them on commercial jobs as well. When customers, when we're not trying to use a harder, um, uh, like a structure, um, I call them ready-made walls. Uh, the ones that I don't remember the name and I'm not here to advertise them, but the ones that are, you know, built, you line them up, you raise it up and it goes in you've seen them in the fiberglass walls and they have the doors and the closer and they're all you know they're extremely beautiful but extremely expensive at the same time mm -hmm. um plus there's a lot of takedown storage all the other things go into it i'm not quite sold on them yet uh but maybe the company wants to do a demo with us one day so that we can actually see what they're all about um personally i'm a big wood and metal frame person uh, i love wood and metal frame I use clear plastic on most all my jobs because it helps with lighting. Uh, you want to make sure that it's lit. Uh, but on commercial jobs, like I said, I'll use dark plastic because uh, you just don't want people seeing what you're doing. And that's just kind of is what it is. Um, you know, it, it's, it's important uh, to make sure that your containments are structurally sound because you're going to have guys working in and out of them, in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out all day. And if they break a seal, if they break this, they break that. I can't tell you 
everybody has a beautiful containment on day one. I want to see pictures of everybody's containments on day three, four, five, (laughs) when they're taking bags in and out of there. You know, everybody's doing these C flaps and these different flaps. I mean, granted, old school Z flaps, I like them because you can open up a doorway and it actually gives you an area to walk in and out of. An old school Z flap is better than doing a C zipper or any of these other zippers. So it's huge, huge. Parker just said what it was. Stark Containment is the name. Uh, mm-hmm. Stark. Um, mm-hmm. So, Stark Containment Company. If you want to send us some of your products so that we can there test you them, go. we'll video it and we'll give some feedback to people on whether or not we could justify the cost of it on our job sites. And maybe mm-hmm. you can tell me how or why <clears throat> it is a cost-effective mechanism on doing what we do. Because I'll tell you what, I can build some sexy containments that aren't made out of fiberglass and that I take down and throw away and put in the trash when I'm done with it. And I don't care if it gets beat up because I buy new wood framing for it every time. So um, I might be your hardest sell, but if you can sell me, then maybe you can sell a bunch of people in the industry. So what's up? There you uh, go. Getting back to it though, framing, I personally think that using wood or metal framing is huge. PVC framing is great, but if you put a stronger, I, like I had mentioned, I use a stronger negative a, uh, pressure on my containment with that it flexes and it just sucks in it makes the plastic on your containment a weird shape um just i don't like it uh i use it for decon chambers uh we use it for washout chambers if we're doing like a washroom and stuff like that because you can have them ready made you can make them a certain size keep it at the shop wrap it up with a couple bungee cords put it together real quick but all my containments are custom um being that I am a contractor and we do a lot of the build back work and I can do the drywall patches. I don't mind putting a screw into some drywall into a furring strip behind the wall to make sure that I have a two by four attached to a wall. I don't because when I take it out, I can fix it, paint it and make it right. Um, I guarantee my customer for it and the insurance company most likely will pay me to do those repairs anyway. So um, I'm not concerned with those little screw holes. Um, Pressure fit is great, uh, but the problem with pressure fit is, is that I found is I work in a lot of high-end houses. So granted, if you go stick it in a $120 door and you break a $120 door because yeah. you essentially extend the jam and spread the jam out, great. Um, but I would rather staple it to the $7 of door casing that goes around it that I can cut with a razor blade, replace within 15 minutes, re and repaint in probably an hour. Uh, rather than having to uninstall and reinstall an entire door because of the fact that I pressure fitted and it essentially in order to be tight enough to make sure that it was stay with still the load. Um, you really got to put some pressure on it and it's going to separate your door jams and it's essentially going to break a door uh, structure. Um, and that is on you. That wasn't caused by the loss. That's caused by you, the contractor. So pressure fit, just be very careful where you do it. If you're going to build a structure, and pressure fit within the structure you build, by all means, do that. That's a good way to set up a temporary structure without having to use a bunch of screws. Um, <coughs> you have a concrete ceiling and a concrete floor, pressure fit it all day long. You don't even need to use a screw. You can build the whole structure and make that thing tight as can be. You don't have to worry about raising it up. But uh, say you're running pressure fit two by fours through a living room to separate the clean area from the non-clean area and you go through the middle of a room, well, there's roof trusses that are sitting across spanning the load. <coughs> if you lift it up in the middle, not only are you probably going to separate by a quarter of an inch something, whether it be a drywall in a corner and a seam or a crack, there's a lot of downsides to the issues that these things cost. And I would much rather fix a screw hole um, than <coughs> a whole seam uh, down a, a corner or an edge of a wall, a crack a whole entire scene within a ceiling because I did some pressure fitting or I sent some guys out even worse, sent my guys out, told them, Hey guys, pressure fit this. And then, you know, you got Joe strong guy goes in there with a sledgehammer and just was like, Dunk, and it's just like poof, right through the ceiling. You know, there's so, <laughs> so Whitney, much- I have a suggestion for you. You're explaining this very well. You should do a containment class in your facility. Um, you should do that because it seems to me like you're kind of passionate about this topic and yeah. I think you would probably know. And, and of course, being a contractor, I think, you know, the rebuild guy back, I think you would have a whole lot you could do with that to help people. Yeah, I'd love to. Uh, if people were really interested in taking it, I've done it a couple of times. We have a little class set up that we've done for really just an add on for a lot of the other classes that we kind of hold. If we were doing a mold remediation class, I mm-hmm. used to do for Normie. 
Um, mm -hmm. So that was before my NORC days uh, when I was teaching for the state licensing with them. And uh, it was an add-on of what I do for some of the people that I did consulting for. So I'd go into their companies and help them kind of learn how to do the containments. Uh, it's pretty easy. Yeah, I, I would be interested if we had anybody who was interested in taking a containment class. I'd be more than happy to yeah. arrange. We have a classroom, so we can obviously do that do it for cheap. Just got to make sure I cover your guys' food. Um, so make it worth your while. And uh, do a little two-day class on everything you could possibly need to know about containments. Yeah. Positive, negative pressure, things like that. Um, the Stark Walls, maybe they would want to sponsor the class and send over some of their stuff so we can mess with it and play with That's it. That's a great idea. Who knows? That would be cool. I mean, I've never even messed with it. I've never seen it on a job site. I've only seen pictures. So it looks really cool. Mm -hmm. um, I have seen some walls where it only went up so high, so they had to use plastic between the next area, and that just looked like crap. Um, but I want to see it. So, you know, granted, I'm probably the not going to just be your salesperson because of the fact that it looks cool. Um, if it sucks, I'm definitely going to call you out. So as long as you're willing to accept those results, if they are what they are, um, we'd love to have your stuff to test them out. Other than that, we can just go down to the good old Home Depot, Lowe's or Menards and uh, buy ourselves some wood, metal and plastic. And we could do some cool stuff with it for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah we already talked about this. Let's talk about some cautionary things, guys, real quick. Some cautionary things. A lot of the, just a couple small ones. Um, don't ever put the plastic on light bulbs and then turn on the lights. Uh, a lot of people will wrap painters plastic, whether it be a fan or a more importantly, a chandelier or some other type of sconce or light fixture because they're painting <clears throat> but they need light. So they turn on the lights and they wrap them in plastic. These are how we start fires on our job sites. This is why we carry liability insurance. So let's <laughs> contractors and reduce our liability as much as we can. And you know, <laughs> in plastic. Yeah. Um, fire sprinkler heads are another big one while you're setting up containments, especially if you're using wood structures and you're using, um, I mean, anything really where you're working in areas where you could possibly just clip a, a water line. Uh, you, you may be there fixing one of the other ones that broke, but you don't want to break another one. Uh, Cause then it's on, once again, liability insurance, um, drop ceilings. You gotta be really careful with drop ceilings a, because of the fact that they are not a containment barrier. So you're going to have to either manipulate something to create a containment barrier to get rid of one. Uh, and like I said, you're not really going to do a pressure fit containment with the drop ceiling. You will nope. ruin it. I promise you. Or do something. <laughs> to it. it won't be fun. Uh, you won't have too much pressure. It just won't be there. So it won't be pressure fit no matter how you cut it. Um, then two layers of poly on floors. If you want to play a joke on a friend, put two <laughs> layers of poly on the floor. It's pretty funny. <laughs> but if you want to reduce workman comp accidents and workman comp claims, yeah. don't put two layers of poly on the floor. Just don't do it. I mean, I'm not even a big fan of putting any poly on the floor. Uh, personally, I would rather use proper floor protection uh, mm -hmm. just because I want my seals around my edges to be to the floor. Um, and I can't really draw here my board. I got to, I'm going to get a board for back here so I can draw. You should. Back. That'd be a good idea. Need something <laughs> to draw. On. Um, but essentially a couple little tips that I want to give you guys for containments that I have always found very, very helpful. If you run, what do you want to call it? Preservation tape, painter's tape, whatever. Um, if you run that along the wall and don't try to think about attaching your plastic to your preservation tape and don't even worry about that you run three layers of it get a section about yay the size of your eyebrows maybe my eyebrows i got big eyebrows so maybe a little bit bigger than the size of your eyebrows because my <laughs> eyebrows, so i call them my caterpillar friends um anyways you want about, say, six to eight inches, probably eight inches wide. If you do six inches wide of preservation tape around what you're doing, then you're, so, you're, you're normally good. Then you can run your duct tape 
and you can actually attach your plastic to your duct tape. Nothing crazy, nothing special, guys. But the fact is, is the duct tape sticks really well to the preservation tape. And if you're sticking to the middle of a six-inch strip of preservation tape, the likelihood that it's going to peel from one of the edges right. is more likely than it will from the middle. If you put it in the middle, it's not going to pull up. So you start where you're going to put your tape and you work your way out so that, that piece is just lacquered on there. And then you go over it again with your duct tape and you essentially seal it there. Like I said, guys, I am not scared to put holes in the wall, so I'll use staples. Take some quick little putty and some paint. You're usually always painting if you're doing demo anyways. So mm -hmm. <clears throat> don't be scared to use some staples. If you're going to use staples, all right, take a little square of duct tape, put them on your plastic, staple the duct tape. Mm -hmm. I can promise you your containment will come down one-tenth of the time that it did, and the only time it's going to be is if one of your guys goes through like a wrecking ball. Because plastic's not going to hold through the staple, but the layers of fibers within the tape will actually hold that staple. And then you can put another, I teach my guys to put another layer of tape over it, and then they actually do a strip, which was the second layer of it over it, um, to cover and seal again. So you're basically ensured that you're not coming out. It, when you pull those out, the staples come out of the wall. So it's a really good solid seal. And then the staple holes are really, really easy. A um, couple other little things. When you're cutting out holes, line up whatever you're doing and cut little pizzas from the inside diameter of whatever you're pushing through. And then let the plastic expand and stretch and go around the rest. Wrap it with tape. Cut off your bottom pieces of your pizza. Don't eat them. Plastic is not safe. If it's killing the whales, it'll kill you too. So don't eat your pizza slices. Um, that's just a really easy way to seal up the, uh, you know, your, your exhaust and the different ways of your, your containments. Mm -hmm. Lay flat is your best friend. I don't care who tells you what about performance or efficiency or whatever. As long as you are reaching the level of Pascal's or water column or water, whatever you want to say, <clears throat> you're reaching the water column level of inches per, what is it, inches per, it's just for, I wish it was in front of me. I use Pascal's. So at the end of the day, use whatever measurement you're going to use. Uh, I use Pascal's personally. Make sure you're getting the negative air that you want to get. And as long as you're achieving it with the equipment you have, it doesn't matter whether it's 500 CFM, 450, or 425, or 401. If you're getting the negative air that you're trying to achieve with that single unit, then you're getting it. If you're not, then you're going to have to add another unit go figure and you just turn them down and adjust them and get, get it where you want to get it. They have monitors that can tell you when they shut down at night. Um, you can spend a lot of money on those. What I did is I employed this special high tech device called my customers. They pick up their cell phones and tell me when one of the machines goes down and I make sure that my seals on my containments are good enough to make sure that if, even if a scrubber goes down, I have a very limited amount of chance that something's going to escape. Right. Granted, I put them on breakers that I know aren't going to trip. I make sure that every piece of equipment that I use to control my negative air is on a breaker with its own GFI and that is tested out for multiple hours at a time before we leave it. So I can't tell you, got knock on wood, can't tell you the last time that I've had a scrubber go down on me. It just doesn't happen. Hmm. Um, Parker said he always wondered if I knew about my eyebrows. I had no clue. I actually just <laughs> figured it out the other day when someone made a comment on it on the wet, on the page. And I think once I cut my hair, um, it made them bigger. But my beard's <laughs> coming back, so they're getting smaller again. Yeah, because uh, the, fo the focus is going to be down here now. So yeah, it's bad. It, it won't be. It's coming. <laughs> you know, I had to get rid of the, you know, I'm back up to what? This is like 22 again. You know, I went from 14 to 22 in a week. Next right. week, I'll be at 45. Um, cardboard floors, he said. Huge, 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 huge yeah. thing. Um, I don't care what brand you use, but make sure whatever brand you use it has a moisture barrier in it and is actually rated for drop protection so that if you drop a drill or any other tools and you're on a very, very high-end wood floor that essentially would cost you tens of thousands of dollars to replace, 
we got to make a thing too where it's like liability you know yeah it's like because these things are important and these are the reasons we bring them up because we don't want to see people making these mistakes i mean mm-hmm. i made a mistake one time working too close to a fish tank didn't oh. touch it. it was too close to it wasn't my fault i found out at the end of the day they put cork underneath the wrong way but still my guy was working four feet from it he was the only person at the house so guess who paid for the fish tank yep guy <laughs> and when it's a professional golfer's fish tank you don't argue about it you just say what kind of fish do you want that's How right big? you know <laughs> grab your yeah. mask and a little and, net and it's like, i'm going swimming <laughs> i'm going swimming and there's a that's a really good point to bring up as far as you know liability goes like i have I have on occasion had an adjuster when it came to a content job that he didn't feel that the containment was necessary. And I could, I mean, honestly, it was more necessary for a liability standpoint for me. So I, I'm like, Hey, you know what? I'm not charging you for this. And I didn't, but I'm doing it because I did it for myself. So there is that, which I don't know for for you guys, it might be different. Sometimes. I mean, for instance, if I'm doing some, like I said, if I'm doing warranty work, obviously I'm not charging anybody for it. If I'm doing painting, normally you're not going to bid it with containments, but at the same time, just be that better. It makes you, here's a perfect example of where you bring value to your service. This Mm -hmm. is where you're not just providing the product that you're selling the customer or the service that you're selling the customer, you're providing them with value with that on top of that. You're yeah. providing them with a level of service that makes them sit there and say, wow, I truly realize why I'm paying 20% more for right. these services because yep. these guys wear booties. They put down floor protection yep. and take it down and take it up every single day and this and that. And you know, they take my dogs out for walks and like, I mean, I had mm-hmm. a customer last week specifically last week. I mean, granted it was estate management. We don't do dog walking, but we love this customer <laughs> Had him for like seven or eight years now. Mm. She's like, we're going out of town. Uh, my daughter's home and she's working during the day. Da, 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 da. But we're out of town. Can you make sure that the dogs get out all day? We literally had to send a guy to their house every day to go let their little dogs out and play. But that's yeah. customer service to me. You know what I think? I, I, I know that I, I, you're absolutely right, Whitney. That is customer service. But I almost like feel like sometimes customer service gets to be like a overused word that yeah. loses its value. I like to think of it as you're providing a unique experience for your client that I'm going to just about guarantee the majority. I mean, when's the last time you had a service? I mean, you, you have a home, right? And mm-hmm. you have a car. And you have a cell phone and things like that. So we have to have services done, right? Within our our homes and and have service, HVAC people, whatever. When's the last time you had one of them give you such an extraordinary experience, bless you, um, with them when you use their service that you're just like, wow, it doesn't happen very often. So I like to think of it as it's, it's more like, your customer experience, not just customer service. And that, remember last week we were talking about when John asked me about marketing contents division and I made, I made the analogy of be the red sports car in the parking lot full of blue sedans. Yep. That's what you're talking about, Whitney, right there. That's yep. yeah. I mean, it's you're providing something that nobody else in your entire exactly. field will. And yep. the only reason I, the only, this customer specifically is the only reason why we have an estate management division started mm-hmm. because when we were just doing restoration and we did the motor remediation job for me, he's like, well, is there any way you can prevent, like, I don't want my house flooding if a, if a pipe breaks and this and that, can you just make sure that my house works and da, 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 da. So we started doing quarterly inspections and created a system and a process and a whole other division for it. And after three years of doing it for him solid, we realized, Hey, maybe we're onto something. So we started advertising it and marketing it a little bit more. And, you know, we're, seven years into that business now and essentially it's just created itself and what it is is it's not only is it a foot in the door for all my other services that we offer with all my different right but -hmm. it's also a place to whereas especially with a customer like this to whereas i value them i mean (laughs) i value them they're like literally i could close my entire company do nothing but just take care of their house and i could probably make the same amount of money i make now 
and just do all the work myself. So I, they provided work for my guys, consistency. Mm -hmm. and, you know, they're a very right. valued customer. They asked me to go walk the dogs, go walk I'm the dogs. I'm the dogs. Pick yep. up the poop, go pick up the poop. <laughs> I'm not picking up the poop anymore, which is good. Um, but seven years later, you know, five, six years of me doing it myself. Yeah. Um, I'm a very in the field and in, in the dugout, you know, I'm really, mm -hmm. I'm in there. I'm in <laughs> I'm in the dirty, dirty, dirty parts of what we do with my guys every time. And I enjoy it. My guy walked up to me the other day. He goes, you really love this shit, don't you? I'm like, I love it. I truly do. You're like Mike Rowe in a crawl space full of like poop, right? Like you'd be down oh. there with the Tyvek and here's Whitney it's with like poop up that. to here on his face mask. And he'd just be like, I'm in it. It's so funny you say that because – we had the first sewage job I had in a while come in the other day. It was a commercial job, just shit all over the floor. And <laughs> my guys walk in and they're all gagging, like gagging. Oh. I walk in, I'm like, I was just like, oh, all right. Another day at right? the office. Right. Um, and my guy looks at me and goes, bro, what the fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> my friends. <laughs> what the fuck is wrong with you? How, how? He goes, I, I'm really worried about you. The fact that this is not making you even cringe at the light, you know, at the slightest. Mm -hmm. And it's like, right. and this is my partner in my carpet cleaning company. This is the first sewage job that he's ever done. And I'm training him on a lot of the water damage stuff. Mm -hmm. um, he's in there with a respirator. I literally walked in and to, I wasn't in the room with the sewage, but I'm like in the room right outside of the sewage. And it's still, it's bad smell wise. I mean, it wasn't great. I'm not going to sit here and say, I was like, yeah, I'll eat lunch there or something like that. But um, <laughs> I'm glad to hear say, that. Yeah. I will say that I guess I've kind of come pretty used to and accustomed to some of these things that we come across. And it's like, I guess a couple of guys, like I talked to Parker and a couple of these other guys often and, they talk to me about how they do a lot of these uh, trauma jobs and they'll walk into a trauma job. I don't know if I could handle a trauma job the same way they could. And I think they may handle trauma jobs and look at it the same way that I look at this type of a job, you know, like a sewage job. I had a bad boss and it was like, we weren't even given respirators when I started working, you know, gloves, mm -hmm. you know, wrap your hands in some plastic and, you know, do whatever you need to do. Granted, we were given some gloves every once in a while, but, um, you know, it was very, 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 uh, trying times working for the old company there, uh, down in the marathon area. Uh, it was tough. And, and so there's a lot of really great reasons to you or to use the containments. Obviously there's the need to get the job done. Right. Right. Yep. Like you're dealing with mold or you need to do a wood floor dry out. So there's the actual getting the job done correctly part, then there's safety because there is, I mean, on a trauma scene, it's huge. Um, not just for you, but for others who may be coming into the job while you're there doing the cleaning, which I kind of hope others aren't. I don't let anyone else come in when we're doing a trauma scene, but, and speaking of trauma scene, I did one. I'll never do one again. I don't do them. My husband and my son do them. Um, I do like the auxiliary support part in the billing, but I don't do them there for anyway, they're, they're difficult to do for some people. And I'm one of those people, but anyway, um, there's also the customer client experience, right. And, and then there's also the professionalism that it's going to give you, um, because you're, I mean, again, you don't just want to throw up some painters plastic and some duct tape, like don't, if, if you're going to make it look like crap, don't do it because that's obviously one, it's not going to work, right? It's not going to be effective. Um, well, maybe if it looks like crap, it might be effective. I don't know, but it's, why would you do it that? Look like, like crap and be effective. True. But true. But what why are you, are you giving yourself as a contractor? What credit exactly. are you giving yourself? Yeah. And what name does that give us as restorers? And this exactly. is I got to touch on it because we've hit on it every single video yep. that we've done so far. And it's so important to me. Yep. This is what we're trying to define yes. is what is a restorer. And through these videos, through the organization itself mm -hmm. and creating a quality constructed uh, containment is essential to so many different aspects of what we do, whether it be drying mold, 
or just basically building it in your warehouse to teach mm-hmm. oh, excuse me to teach your guys um, yeah. if you're not teaching them and doing it the best possible way that you can yeah. it, they're not going to do it that way yep you teach them it this way they're going to do it 90% at best you're never going to get 100%, especially the first time they go do it without you being there. It's never going to mm-hmm. be 100% of the way you did it. You could right. always fix something. So you got to teach them at 110, 120%. So that when they take that 20 or 30% off, yep. <laughs> they're still at like 95 or 100%. Yeah. And at least yeah. it's where you, you're willing to accept it at. This is what we do. Mm-hmm. Yep. You don't just set drying equipment, guys. We don't just put air scrubbers in buildings. We don't just spray hydroxyl or <laughs> spray hydroxyl. <laughs> we don't just spray <laughs> chemicals or yeah. set hydroxyls. Right. We know what chemicals we use and why we use them. We know what machines we use and why we use them. We have processes and reasons for everything that we do. Mm-hmm. As restorers, we have to set ourselves to a higher standard. Yeah. Just because somebody else did it with zip poles and made it look okay and it worked and got past every job through that does not mean that it's not essential to hold yourself to a higher standard yeah. and build a containment that you can be proud of mm-hmm. at the least. If the customer doesn't appreciate it, you can take some pictures of it and use it for marketing. Absolutely. I can tell you what, I'm not going to take a picture of any of my little half-ass dinky little containments that I do for my little drywall work or whatever it is. It's not like I'm going to set it up, stick my hand out the door and be like, Hey guys, hey. Hey. <laughs> you know? it's, it's not going to happen. Yeah. You it's, know, Whitney, that's a really good point. And that's what I was saying earlier when I was talking about, you know, I've done containment and contents, which I don't do a ton of, I don't need to, but when I do, I've done it and I haven't got paid for it, but I did it for me. I did it because I knew it was the right thing to do. And I wanted my level of expertise and my client experience to be, I, I wanted to go, I go home every night and sleep really well, knowing that I went above and beyond. I can honestly tell you that on every single job I've ever been on. I can tell you that in 18 years, I can absolutely say I have gone above and beyond. And it's things like that, that, you know, we, I hope all of you that are watching this can say that. And if you can't, then, you know, you need to reevaluate. But that is exactly why cool. Whitney and I, you, we talked about doing these videos before we started them. And, and one of the big reasons that we wanted to do this was to raise the industry up. It was to raise the level of professionalism and was to hold all of us to a higher standard. Um, you know, we all rise together. There's, that's a, I don't even know who said that originally, that phrase, but we all rise together. It's true. We all can be brought down together as well. So, you know, the more of us that are doing things this way, the right way. And you know what? If you're listening and you don't understand, maybe don't do containments as much because you're like, eh, I'm not really that comfortable with it. Then go take a class. I mean, Whitney, just listen to what he's just been saying. I want to take a class from him for Pete's sake. It's great. I mean, his knowledge. There are people in the industry that have the knowledge. Go do your due diligence, just like anything else in this industry where education is important, go learn and develop that skill because it is very important for us as restoration professionals to know it. So, Yeah, I mean, being a trade that we are, mm-hmm. I don't think that there's any possible replacement of physical hands-on learning experiences and i'm not even talking about classroom settings i'm talking about doing it on a job mm-hmm. seeing it function for the reason it was supposed to function for yeah seeing it work from start to finish and how it lasted to understand why you do certain things the way you do or why you don't do certain things a certain way because of the mm-hmm. fact that it fails you in certain aspects. You know, anybody can teach you how to put up a containment. Truly. I mean, even a nice containment. Any, I could take a square piece of plastic, three pieces of tape, take my time, put them up, right? And it'll, it'll hold for an hour or two. I come back tomorrow, the next day, I bet you money that's that's down. 
I bet you money it's not sticking. I bet you money those things. I see people using, if you'll hear me talk, I'm going to get into materials here in a minute, you know, and I'm not going to really go through them. I'm just going to rip through them real quick. We use zip walls, yeah. zip, we use staples, we use preservation tape, we use duct tape, we use razor knives, and we use, um, I use a level like I talked about earlier. But um, the one thing you're not going to hear me talk about and hear me push a lot, and granted, it could be a tool certain times, is spray adhesive. Um, I'm not a big fan of using spray adhesive for containments. If you're using spray adhesive in order to extend, say, a 20-foot run of uh, poly and you're going to overlap it and glue it together and actually take the time to make sure there's no air gaps in it and so on and so forth, fine. There's certain purposes where spray adhesive can be used. I don't think that people should be spraying spray adhesive in people's homes and should be spraying it near their materials and their objects because some of the right. chemicals that are in them can affect, even if it gets on the paint on the wall, can affect the paint on the wall. Yeah. Um, whereas the preservation tape on its own can cause secondary damages. I mean, I've peeled preservation tape off and peeled tape off and peeled paint off certain areas before. It's not perfect. It is not perfect. Um, so use it sparingly as far as then I just want to be cautious. So kind of between materials and caution areas, I just kind of put the spray adhesive in that area to where it's just be very cautious with it. Working in confined environments with spray adhesive. Think about it. Not good. Unless you want your guys huffing blue. They'll be <laughs> maybe wreck a truck or something for you on the way home. Right. Like, it's not what I like. Anyways, those are some very simple things. Um, wow, we're already at an hour. Um, I, yeah, did, I thought this one would be quick. Uh, I did too. I did too, but I'm totally digging it. I hope everybody else is. Yeah. Um, and we will, we will, maybe we'll set up some times to do a class. I want to talk to you about getting your class over to the East Coast. We need to talk yeah. to a couple of the manufacturers of the materials and the, uh, the cleaning. That'd be awesome. Maybe we could coordinate it, Whitney. Maybe we could do contents and then you can do some, that'd be awesome. I'd love that to do, and you do some specialty containment stuff. That'd be great. Yeah, if there's time, um, let's talk yeah. about that for sure. Um, so, but regardless and, and anybody of watching, down, let us know if that's something that you want. Yeah. And we'll set them up. I mean, we have a, I have a classroom here. Here's real mm -hmm. talk. I have a classroom at my facility and here's the invitation. I'm not looking to make a ton of money off of teaching a class. Obviously if I'm teaching a class, I have to make a couple bucks for my time that I'm taking away from not oh, actually right. working. Right. Um, but I will hold a very, very economical class. If you guys want to put a group together and come down to my facility and learn how to do containments. We have a couple other classes that we're going to be doing down there that we're scheduling basically towards the end of the year in the beginning of 2019. Um, mm -hmm. Basically, going to be filling up 2019 there. Hopefully, we'll have Vanessa uh, there yep. for at least two times a year doing the contents cleaning classes um, yep. within our facility. Uh, hopefully, we can have some rug cleaning things. Hopefully, we can have some drying classes. Hopefully, we can mm -hmm. have some different meetings that we're going to have with the different groups and organizations and the different regional group for Florida. You guys want to use our area. Um, mm -hmm. we have it. It's in West Palm. It's here for us to use. No charge to North members to come and meet up in this space and basically have coffees and use it as a uh, common area, if you will, common ground, uh, call it mm -hmm. a, a little home base. Uh, so uh, come visit, come say hi anytime you guys you want. That classroom is there for everyone to use. If you want to teach your Texan here in the area, you want to bring five Texans to say, hey, Whitney, come teach for an hour and just get me to sneak in there. Hey, you are <laughs> because I love helping people out and that's what we're all about in this industry and this organization. So, um, I don't want to take us into two hours. I don't want to go into that. I could keep going on about containment as I truly do love containments, which is the name of this video. So, uh, mm -hmm. this is a good one. We had a lot of great people. Parker was heavily active on here tonight. Uh, thank you Parker for being a huge part of, uh, tonight's conversation. Scott's been on here. Uh, Rhonda is on. Let me scroll through, see if there's anybody, Corey, Steve, uh trip what's up buddy uh let's see who else commented uh josh went josh winton uh we gotta get together buddy i just uh saw your went through your proposal today so we will look through that good amount of people on um we've got some good news we've got some good questions not too many questions uh i should say we had some good amount of comments mm -hmm. um 
But at the end of the day, guys, uh, next week we're going to be talking about drying times. This has been a heavy, heavy topic. I don't give uh, what you want to call the drying times. I don't care how long you want to say you dry things or how fast you dry things. Great. Two thumbs up. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to quote one of my favorite instructors at this point in time. I'm not sure if he created this, but he's getting all the credit for it. My friend <laughs> Mickey Lee. Uh, and his, his quote of saying, it is not dry till it's dry. And we're going to talk about that next week. Uh, the fact that it's not dry till it's dry. And then our final episode, I'm going to do a little pre-announcement here. It's going to be our episode six is going to be, we're going to be talking about uh, some of the intricacies of insurance policies and the language that we need to understand, not as reading the policies, right. because obviously we know, unless you're an adjuster or a lawyer, you cannot right. read the policy, do not interpret it. Uh, but we want to understand so that we can give our customers a heads up on certain things that they need to inquire about when dealing with and talking to their insurance company so you can help them through the process as best possible. And as well as you be a educated contractor, yep. and know what you're getting yourself into on yep. each job and yep. what possible downfalls you might be facing along the way. Mm -hmm. um, these things are very important and yeah. That's going to be a really great episode. That'll be a really, really nice. And any questions that anyone has for either of these episodes coming up, didn't mean to interrupt you, Whitney. I'm sorry. Um, please, like, ask on the NORC page, message Whitney, message me, um, comment below this video. But definitely on the insurance, I'm really excited to do that. Uh, Whitney, because I think that's, I think that's a huge, very important topic. It doesn't get talked about a lot. And it's, it, again, it's not, we're not adjusters. We're not lawyers. Like Whitney said, we're it's not, not going to talk about how to do claims. We're not going to talk no, about, it. no, no, no. It's how to understand the policy so that you protect yourself or know what, as Whitney said, you're getting into as a restoration contractor, because you got to understand that policy yourself, or you could be going right in the middle of a mess that you don't realize, you know, you're dealing with ACV, not RCV. I mean, it's, especially on content, you really have got some stuff you have to understand. So that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to do some heavy research on this one, make sure that we yes. have direct information for you guys so that we're not yep. just talking from our opinions and how we feel about things and using the yeah, agreement. Right. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it'd be all know. official. <laughs> sound all official and look all official, but we want to truly be all official. And hopefully, we can yes. even find maybe even a uh, insurance agent uh, that can yep. come on to the uh, and have this conversation with us. I actually have somebody in mind. He used to be a lawyer for the insurance companies. He now represents homeowners to give them better policies and make sure that they. Uh, know what they're buying and that they're buying right. what they're paying for essentially. So mm -hmm. that's a good thing to do. Um, so yeah, tonight was a good one. I definitely yeah. love containments as you guys can see. Um, I could go on and on and on and on about this. We didn't get into everything about how to build it, but we're, we're going to have some videos coming out. Good. I'll probably start little videos, you know, doing door containments, you know, structured containments, different containments on all the different videos. I don't mind giving out the information for free as long as you guys are willing to watch it. Give me some feedback and tell me what you want to see, what you want to learn. I'm not the only person that knows this stuff, I hope. Uh, and I know for a fact there are some people that are much, much more knowledgeable than myself. So hopefully you guys can give us some great topics so that we can reach outside of my expertise and we can reach into the expertise of a lot of the other individuals within our industry um, and maybe break that into next season or our next uh, series of six episodes uh, maybe we'll even get into some more detailed areas within our industry. Who knows where we'll go with that, but I'm really excited for number five, really excited for number six. Tonight was awesome as usual. Thank you. Yep. It, it was fun. Uh, mm. looks like the sun is still up where you were at. It is yeah. just barely. I had to move my computer cause it was coming through my window here. Just getting ready to sun set out on the beach there. Oh, poor you. I know, right? Feel bad for me. <laughs> no, I know. You guys get the great sunsets out there. We get sunrise, so it's like in a couple you hours, do. I'll, I'll go yeah. on Facebook Live when everybody else is sleeping and show you guys what the sunrise looks do like. Do that. Do that. Yeah, you get the sunrises. We get the sunsets here, you guys, like no other. It I is incredible. Like I'm, I'm more built for a West Coast kind of guy. Oh, <laughs> I really am. I think that it works better. You guys can wake up at 9 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> o'clock in the morning it's i know eight, it's like eight o'clock here and it's right. like i can pretend like i woke up at four o'clock in the morning exactly exactly <laughs> work on California time to tell everybody <laughs> <what I'm talking laughs> about. 
Sleep in. All right, everybody. Well, it was a great night. Episode four, we love your, yeah, episode four, we love containments. We're going to put this up onto YouTube. It'll be both on Anessa's channels as well as my channels. So follow us here and here and here, wherever we have these things later when we edit these things, but we're putting them in now. You saw it live. Uh, If you watch this live, go ahead and uh, leave your comments here. Let us know that you watch this live. Let us know any questions you have. We will respond via email. If you have a question, just leave your email, obviously, with it. Uh, we will respond via email or uh, maybe we'll cover it in our next video. Uh, if you don't have a question, well, that's no fun. Start coming up with some questions, guys. <laughs> right. uh, more about questions. So we can come up with lots of stuff to talk about, but we need to have some involvement here. So anyways, All right, I'm going to go to bed. You have yeah. a great night. And I, I hope will. everybody else has an amazing night as well. We will see you next week. Same time, same place. Yep. Well, you know, we will be here. We'll talk to you soon. That's have right. a great night. Corp Nation, love y'all. Bye. Bye.